Hello, I'm uh, Mark Nepper, Chief of the Laboratory of Kidney and Electrolyte Metabolism at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Today, it's my pleasure to interview uh, Maurice B. Berg uh, about his nearly 50-year history, uh, uh, career rather, in science. Uh, Dr. Berg is a principal investigator in the Laboratory of Kidney and Electrolyte Metabolism at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. Throughout his career, Dr. Berg has been a leader in the field of renal physiology. He's known for the development of critical technology uh, that has opened new paths to discovery of many of the physiological principles that comprise our modern understanding of renal function and osmotic regulation. Not only we will, will we hear today about the invention of the isolated perfused tubule technique uh, for which he's best known, but we'll also hear about a, a host of uh, other innovations basic to the study of kidney physiology. Now this interview is being conducted on May 10th, 2005 at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. The producer is Alice Hardy. Copies of the interview will be distributed to the American Physiological Society for its eminent physiologist archives and to the International Society of Nephrology for its legacy archive. A copy will also be deposited in the office of the NIH history here in Bethesda. Now sitting on my right is Dr. Berg, known to his friends as Mo. Let's start at the beginning. Did you have any early interest in science? Uh, sadly, no. <laughs> Those were before the days of science fairs and uh, that kind of uh, effort to attract people to science. I did enjoy my science courses in high school, but no more so, for example, than uh, English courses. And in college, uh, my major was psychology, which in retrospect was hardly scientific, at least in those days. So why did you decide to go to medical school? Uh, the choices uh, seemed to be between a career in medicine and a career in law. Uh, my father wanted me to go into law. Maybe that's why I ended up in medicine. <laughs> that's not clear right now. Uh, anyhow, I kept my uh, options open in college, and I found that I was enjoying my uh, pre-med uh, courses. Uh, the uh, die was cast finally when, uh, after three years in college, I applied to Harvard Medical School, and they accepted me. And so I ended up in medical school uh, at that point. So how did you uh, become interested in kidney physiology then? Uh, well, more or less, more or less by, uh, by accident. Uh, being a psychology major uh, seemed natural to go into psychiatry after medical school, but uh, I had f classes in uh, medical school, in psychiatry, and clinics, and uh, it all seemed pretty futile uh, at that point. And uh, so I turned my interest to more traditional uh, kinds of medicine. Uh, the, I, uh, after uh, medical school, I was an intern at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. And in those days, uh, we had uh, a draft for doctors. The draft was, <laughs> the, uh, draft was called the Berry Plan. And you had an interesting choice at that time. The choices were you could uh, either volunteer to go into the Army Medical Corps, in which case you went in as an officer, or you could uh, uh, not volunteer, in which case you would be drafted as a private. Uh, most physicians volunteered, as I did. And so while an intern at the Beth Israel Hospital, I had my orders to report to Fort Sam Houston for basic training. In the, uh, in the Army, in the Army Medical Corps. However, uh, about two-thirds of the way through the internship, I got a telegram from the Army, and the telegram said that they had uh, over-enlisted in the Berry Plan that year, and if I could find a medical residency, they would permit me to take that medical residency before serving in the, uh, in the Army. That seemed like a good deal, so I went scurrying around Boston looking for a medical residency at that late uh, time. And uh, 
where I ended up was at the Boston VA Hospital, which you can uh, uh, see some of the personnel here in this first uh, slide. Uh, when I first went there for an interview, uh, the interviewer was Dan Holtzman, who was the uh, head of cardiology. Now, uh, while it, the Beth Israel had a very strong program in cardiology, and that was really what interested me at that point, so I was pleased to go into a residency in cardiology. However, when I arrived at the VA hospital to begin my cardiac residency, I discovered that I was a resident in kidney and endocrine. And so I immediately began seeing consults in kidney disease and uh, endocrine disease. Now the, uh, the chief of medicine in the hospital uh, was Maurice Strauss, who's a very charismatic uh, person, great teacher. And his interest was kidney physiology. And so uh, he had a kidney physiology program going in the hospital at that time. The people who were mainly responsible for that were two physicians, Saul Papper and Jack Rosenbaum. Um, the uh, kidney physiology consisted of clearance experiments in veterans. And so I was soon involved in infusing veterans <laughs> with various solutions, with inulin and uh, under various uh, conditions. Uh, uh, Saul uh, went on to become uh, chief of medicine at the, uh, in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Jack, sadly, uh, developed uh, colon cancer while I was at uh, the VA hospital and died. Uh, he was uh, a very promising uh, kidney physiologist at that time, which is very sad for all of us. And the next. Now, uh, as a result of my uh, kidney physiology at the VA, uh, there were two papers. Uh, this is the uh, second one, which is the uh, uh, factors influencing the diuretic response to ingested water. And by that time, uh, there were already uh, published works by uh, Wirtz, which uh, uh, indicated that uh, fluid in the early distal tubule uh, should be diluted. And the, uh, so the idea that uh, the free water clearance, which we were studying, might be uh, regulated by uh, sodium delivery uh, to uh, uh, those regions of the, of the kidney were already understood. And that was more or less the conclusions that we came to in this paper. Uh, it wasn't until many, many years later that uh, had the opportunity to actually look at the mechanisms involved <coughs> and uh, describe the transport mechanisms in the kidney that were responsible. So uh, that was uh, uh, in your hometown in Boston. How did you happen to come to the NIH? Uh, halfway through my residency at the VA hospital, again, there was a serendipitous occurrence. Uh, Murray Strauss came to me and said that he had contacts at the National Institutes of Health and how would I like to become a public health officer and do research at the National Institutes of Health instead of being a medical officer in the Army and uh, treating the uh, soldiers. That seemed like a very good deal <laughs> to me. <laughs> so I volunteered to go to NIH, which uh, fulfilled my requirement under the Berry Plan. Okay, then uh, why have you stayed at NIH uh, so long after your uh, postdoctoral fellowship there? Um, well, my, I first came to NIH in 1957, and so I was there for, for two years initially uh, as a uh, fellow. Then I went back for a third year of residency to the uh, VA. Uh, I think by that point I had already decided that I liked research very much so that uh, during my uh, residency at the VA, I was trying to decide whether I wanted to continue there or whether I wanted to uh, return to NIH, since uh, Jack Orloff, who was my mentor at NIH, had already uh, mentioned to me that if I wanted to come back, I could. Well, th there was no comparison between the research opportunities at the VA and the research op opportunities at the NIH, so I uh, very quickly elected to go back to the NIH.
And uh, the research was marvelous, NIH is marvelous, and uh, I've never found reason to leave since then. <laughs> so this was uh, the kidney, uh, Laboratory of Kidney and Electrolyte Metabolism uh, that uh, you uh, uh, first went to. Uh, what was it like when you arrived in the laboratory in 1957? Uh, I think you, that's best described in uh, terms of the people who were there, which is on the next slide. In those days, uh, there weren't many pictures being taken in the laboratory. Nowadays, we take a picture every year with all of the lab members. So this is the closest I can come to uh, picturing the people who were there. The uh, occasion was a uh, dinner given for uh, Barbara Linner uh, many years later in Atlantic City. But uh, many of the principal uh, people I want to talk about are represented uh, in this picture. Uh, central uh, to it all uh, is uh, Berliner and uh, Jack Orloff. And those, those were the principal people in the laboratory, and they set the tone in the laboratory. Uh, they were both uh, brilliant critics, very bright people. And uh, it was uh, an education just to uh, listen to them and to discuss the various aspects of kidney physiology. Uh, even more impressive, uh, they were very widely respected in the kidney community and even, I think, uh, feared a little bit because they were such uh, 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 powerful critics. Uh, a memory uh, goes back to Atlantic City. Uh, in those days, the principal meetings for uh, research uh, scientists in, uh, uh, in renal uh, uh, physiology were in Atlantic City. Uh, the first meeting being the clinical societies at the uh, Haddon Hotel, and the second meeting uh, being the physiology society at the uh, convention center. And, of course, there were uh, sessions uh, uh, at the meetings, but a lot of, of what was most important went on on the boardwalk outside of the meetings. And I can recall uh, Berliner uh, holding court on the boardwalk, and having uh, very uh, eminent investigators come up to him to uh, tell him about uh, their ideas and their uh, work and to get uh, his view on it. And his view was very important to them in uh, what they should make of it themselves. In the meetings, uh, you would have a 10-minute talk and then five minutes of discussion in which uh, uh, people would um, ask questions or make criticisms. Uh, uh, I think there was a, a, a gripping of fear on the young fellows' faces when Berliner would stand up to ask his question <laughs> or make his criticism of their work. Uh, uh, the uh, laboratory of kidney electrolyte metabolism had begun in 1948. I didn't arrive there till 1957. Uh, the, uh, first uh, director of the Heart Institute was James Shannon, who was a famous kidney physiologist. When he uh, staffed the uh, Heart Institute, uh, the first laboratory that he staffed, or one of the first laboratories, was the Laboratory of Kidney and Electrolyte Metabolism, which remains the longest established laboratory in the Heart Institute. Why a kidney laboratory in the Heart Institute? Well, Shannon realized that the most important uh, cardiac uh, diseases involve the kidney, congestive failure, hypertension, salt retention, and so on. And uh, he recruited uh, Berliner, uh, who was a brilliant young uh, uh, kidney physiologist uh, at that point, uh, to head the laboratory. So Berliner was the first lab chief. But he was only lab chief for a couple of years. Uh, uh, he went on to become director of the uh, Heart Institute intramural, and Jack Orloff took over uh, as the lab chief at that point. They, they had very different personalities. Uh, Berliner uh, was the quiet sort. You had to sort of press him to get his opinions. Uh, Jack was very outspoken, very uh, flamboyant. If you wanted to have a party, you would have Jack there as the life of the uh, party. Uh, Jack also had a very abrasive wit. Uh, 
uh, he was uh, prone to make uh, lacerating comments to people in public. And uh, th this was done in a way that was in a joking way so that you couldn't really respond to it uh, without being a poor sport. Uh, and it was generally quite funny to everyone except possibly the person uh, who was the uh, brunt of the, uh, of the joke. Um, at that time, uh, the principal um, event, which is memorable uh, in the laboratory, was our lunches. And so we had lunch every day as a laboratory group. And the uh, lunches, at the lunches, uh, there was a paper presented by one of the fellows. And uh, Orloff and Berliner, who were the professors, would uh, comment uh, on the papers. Uh, and this was quite educational. They were, they were very knowledgeable and very good critics, and so you could learn a lot from it. Uh, in retrospect, uh, one of the aspects of it, which I wasn't really aware of at the time, but I'm aware of now with our new sensibilities, was that uh, the lunches were an entirely male affair at the time that I was there. Well, all of the fellows were male, so that uh, made sense. Uh, the women in the laboratory were uh, the technicians, uh, Nordica Green and Agnes Preston. Uh, and I'm not sure whether they weren't included because they were technicians or because they were women. Uh, at that time, you may recall that when you published a paper, uh, you would have a list of the uh, real authors on the paper, and then it would say, with the technical assistance of, and it would list the technicians, you know, who often were the ones that did the uh, actual work. Uh, we no longer do that, uh, and uh, I never uh, did it. Um, I think the uh, first woman to ever uh, sit in in one of these conferences was a uh, summer student of mine, uh, Evelyn Grohlman. And there was a <coughs> bit of resistance to her <laughs> sitting in, and I'm not sure whether it was uh, because uh, she was a student or whether she was a woman. There was a bit of the old guy's uh, attitude uh, at these conferences, and I think that uh, Jack feared that he would have to be more discreet with his language if there were a woman present than if there were not. At that time in the laboratory, uh, transport physiology was in its infancy. Uh, the only uh, transporter that was uh, really known and was of interest to us was the sodium-potassium ATPase that had been recently discovered by uh, Sko, who, you remember, uh, recently got the Nobel Prize uh, for that discovery. And I think the best transport work in the laboratory was work on red blood cell transport, which was being carried out by uh, Dan Tosteson when I first arrived there, and Joe Hoffman. And then when uh, Dan left uh, to go on to his uh, very eminent career in uh, medicine and uh, medical administration. Uh, Joe Hoffman remained on uh, for many years and uh, learned a lot uh, from Joe. The kidney studies that were going on in the laboratory were largely uh, clearance experiments. And those clearance experiments uh, were mostly carried out uh, in dogs. Um, I did one dog clearance experiment in my career and then for whatever reason, decided not to do uh, any more and ended up uh, with other preparations. I was uh, Jack uh, Orloff's uh, fellow. Uh, the other fellow at that time was Floyd Rector, who's also uh, uh, in this picture. Um, uh, Floyd uh, uh, left after my first year in the laboratory to go uh, to Dallas. Uh, where he had had a very uh, eminent uh, career. Uh, the desk I sat at when I first arrived uh, had been occupied by Mac Walser, who went on to become uh, the uh, professor of uh, pharmacology at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. Um, I became quite close to Floyd during that first year. Uh, we shared a lot of interests. We spent a lot of time talking. I can remember the two of us trying to sit down and figure how a kidney tubule 
could uh, have regulated absorption of sodium based only on the sodium potassium ATPase. And we didn't come up with any answer to that because, of course, much more is required, which was uh, the later work that both of us did. Um, the, of course, you know, they there spent a lot of time there and a lot, a lot of memories. One which is uh, particularly striking uh, has to do with the urinary concentrating mechanism. Uh, this was a, an interest of uh, Berliner's, and uh, it was at the time when the uh, countercurrent mechanism uh, had been described by uh, uh, Hargitay and Kuhn and, and Wirtz. And um, so the puzzle at that point was uh, exactly how the transport processes in the tubule segments in the medulla worked uh, in the countercurrent system. Berliner's idea was that it operated uh, strictly by transport of uh, salt uh, out of the tubule, leaving water behind, which nowadays we would recognize as the avian model of uh, medullary uh, uh, countercurrent uh, multiplication. And uh, he and Norm Levinsky had some clearance experiments that seemed to uh, support that idea, which they uh, submitted as an abstract uh, to uh, the uh, meetings in Atlantic City. However, after they had submitted the abstract, Karl Gottschalk arrived in the laboratory, and he had already at that point made his uh, uh, seminal discoveries regarding the concentrating mechanism and knew that the fluid within the loop of Henle, rather than being dilute according to the Berliner theory, was concentrated as we, as we now know. Um, this was not very good news for, uh, for Norm Levinsky, since he was then faced with presenting an abstract at Atlantic <laughs> City <laughs> in which the uh, conclusion uh, was incorrect. So uh, as a uh, bright young uh, scientist coming to the lab in 1957, what was your initial project? My first project was one that was assigned to me by Jack Orloff. And uh, the uh, question was, uh, uh, is the sodium potassium ATPase important for transport in the kidney? And the way of answering that was to uh, use a specific inhibitor, uh, which in that case was uh, strophanthidin. And the preparation that we uh, chose uh, to study uh, was the renal portal circulation of the chicken. Uh, and this is a, a sketch I made at the time in order to try to understand it, which I won't go over in detail, but the essence of it is that if you infuse uh, uh, a solution into a vein in one leg of a, uh, of a bird or a chicken in this case, uh, the, uh, it will go through a renal portal circulation and uh, result in much higher concentrations of what you infuse around the kidney tubules and the kidney on that side than on the other. So you can uh, have a uh, experimental on one side and uh, uh, control on the other side by collecting the fluid separately uh, from the uh, two ureters. Now, I didn't know at the time, but uh, this project had first been offered to uh, Floyd Rector, and Rector refused to do it. <laughs> I, I was neither uh, knowledgeable enough nor assertive enough to refuse to do it. Um, there were uh, two results from the experiment. Uh, the first result was uh, what we published, that um, the uh, sodium potassium ATPase is very important for, uh, uh, for uh, salt absorption in the kidney. Uh, and this was a, a novel discovery at that point. Uh, the second discovery was that the chicken cloaca, where the urine has come out, is a very filthy place, <laughs> and you don't want to be working in there if you can avoid it. Okay. What, what happened next? Um, well, Jack wanted me to uh, study uh, the uh, sodium potassium ATPase. I was not a biochemist. I had no biochemical training. And frankly, I didn't understand at all what it was biochemically. It was confused in my mind with the uh, ATPase and the mitochondria. I tried reading about it. Uh, Jack was not much help to me. And I finally decided that that was not the thing that I was going to uh, study. Uh, so I, I decided uh, instead uh, to uh, 
study renal transport in vitro, that is, outside of the animal, having already tried a clearance experiment on dogs and not having enjoyed the experience very much. Now, um, there were good reasons at that time to look to in vitro preparations. One was that the most impressive epithelial transport studies at that time were the studies in frog skin coming out of the uh, Wussing uh, laboratory. Uh, and uh, uh, it looked as if uh, that could be carried over in some respects to the kidney because uh, there were already uh, descriptions of experiments on the iron contents of kidney slices, which are carried out by Gilbert Mudge at uh, Johns Hopkins. And um, the, uh, there were also uh, uh, experiments uh, showing that uh, uh, kidney tubules could uh, survive uh, in vitro from uh, uh, a Chambers laboratory. So I uh, adopted uh, Mudge's uh, kidney slice technique and did some studies of the effect of Warbane on the electrolyte content and other aspects of the kidney slices. And in retrospect, none of them were in terribly important results. Mm -hmm. and, and so why did you abandon the kidney slice preparation? I, I realized that, uh, that when you were studying particularly the kinetics of uh, the electrolytes in kidney slices, that there were uh, almost impo Im impossible problems because the kidney slices uh, were relatively thick preparations, many tubules thick, so that uh, there was a diffusion delay for anything that you put into the solutions to get to the surfaces of the tubules. The, the slices, particularly from the cortex, are thick enough so that the um, oxygenation of the tubules in the center uh, is, very, is not very good. And also, uh, you have all sorts of different tubules there, which means you have different kinds of, uh, of cells. So I, I first set out to try to uh, solve the problem of the thickness of the kidney slices, which led to the, uh, to the next slide, which is the uh, preparation of, uh, of kidney tubules. Um, this uh, had never been done up to, up to that point, and I researched a way of doing it by uh, looking at uh, papers uh, uh, in cell culture in which they used uh, enzymes, including collagenase, to disaggregate tissues to start the cells in culture. So I uh, tested collagenase, uh, trypsin, various other enzymes to see if there are any that would dissociate the kidney into tubules that would be uh, surviving, and uh, ultimately uh, devised a method using collagenase to make tubule preparations such as this shown here from the uh, cortex of, uh, of rabbit uh, uh, kidneys. Now, the uh, rabbit was chosen mainly because that was the species I've been working with in the kidney slices, and it's a good species to work with if you want to study sodium potassium ATPase because the uh, ATPase in the rabbits is quite sensitive to cardiac glycosides, whereas the uh, ATPase in rats uh, kidneys, for example, uh, uh, is not. Uh, did a lot of uh, studies with the, with the uh, suspension over a couple of years. Um, the tubule suspensions have been widely used since then. Um, uh, it seems that each person who used it after that, uh, starting with my method, uh, invented it afresh and forgot whether they had gotten the method from. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that's the way science goes. Well, back in those days, the cutting edge technique was uh, considered to be uh, micropuncture. Did you consider doing micropuncture? Oh, yeah. Uh, Floyd uh, Rector and I discussed that a lot. And uh, I wanted to do micropuncture, but I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't do it because Berliner wanted to do micropuncture, and of course he was the professor and uh, decided what went on in the laboratory. And uh, he uh, had uh, assigned uh, Tom Kennedy, who um, was then in the laboratory, to set up micropuncture for him. And when I left the laboratory after my first two years of, um, of a fellowship there, uh, Tom Kennedy was supposed to be setting up uh, to do the micropuncture. By the time I returned a year later, 
Kennedy was no longer there. He had gone into administration, and there was no micropuncture. Rector, who had gone on to Dallas, had started the micropuncture there, and the person who was doing it there was Jim Clapp, James Clapp. And uh, after Jim finished his time in Dallas, uh, he came to NIH, and he's the one that set up the micropuncture uh, at NIH in Berliner's laboratory. Uh, Berliner uh, chose to do micropuncture in dogs, uh, I guess in part because that's where the uh, clearance uh, exper experience with, was and where the knowledge was. Uh, I don't think that that was a, a particularly uh, good choice. It's not, I don't think it's a, a very practical uh, uh, preparation uh, for doing micropuncture. Um, so uh, I couldn't do um, micropuncture. And uh, instead, by the time I left uh, NIH, after my first two years of, uh, of fellowship, I had decided that the way to study the kidney tubules was to take them out of the kidney and perfuse them in vitro, which of course was a rather audacious <laughs> idea at that time. Um, the, uh, uh, it, seemed to, it seemed to me that it was possible. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the examples I had which, which brought it to mind were first the uh, uh, giant squid axon that uh, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley had studied and had uh, famously published by that time. Now a, a squid axon is a millimeter in diameter whereas a kidney tubule is only one twentieth of that diameter so there's a big size difference. However, you looked at the pictures of the axial electrodes in the uh, squid axons and all of the marvelous uh, transport studies, uh, that had to be very attractive. Also, I knew that uh, Chambers had made preparations of uh, tubules from uh, fish and amphibia, and that those tubules survived in vitro to at least transport dyes, so they were still alive. So uh, why not uh, try to uh, 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 make uh, uh, dissociate single tubules and to uh, perfuse them. So how did you uh, learn to dissect these uh, tubules? Uh, well, I, I tried to figure out how to do that myself. Uh, I already had the example of the collagenase, and so uh, it was natural to start with a kidney uh, preparation in which uh, the, the uh, tissue had been treated with collagenase, and it's uh, relatively easy uh, to dissect uh, tubules out. But I didn't know that at the time, and I started with a very cumbersome system, which I was using micromanipulators to try to do the dissection. And it uh, wasn't until we had a visitor uh, to the laboratory, who was Ivar Sperber, that I uh, really uh, found out how to dissect. Now, Ivar Sperber was a uh, famous uh, renal anatomist, he, you may recall, is the one who had uh, discovered the portal circulation in the bird, and which was the first preparation I used. And uh, he had also uh, dissected uh, kidneys and uh, shown all of the tubule segments, which you can see here. Of course, these dissections were on uh, dead tissue that were, uh, mas was macerated with uh, strong hydrochloric acid, and I was trying to dissect more delicate tubules uh, from uh, living specimens. Well, Sperber came to visit the laboratory uh, to give a lecture, and while he was there, uh, he showed me how to dissect tubules, which is with uh, forceps and needles rather than with uh, micromanipulators, and it turned out to be much easier to do it that way. While he was there, uh, Sperber gave a lecture which was very memorable. Uh, while he was lecturing, a uh, messenger kept coming into the room and speaking to Berliner, who would shake his head. At the end of the lecture, Berliner announced that President Kennedy had been shot, and we all rushed out after that to look at the television and see what had happened to the uh, president. I think uh, those of us who were old enough at the time all remember where we were when we got that uh, news. November was, 22nd, 1963. You remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, so 
I, uh, at that point, had learned how to uh, dissect uh, uh, the uh, tubules. Um, what happened after that was that I had my first fellow arrive, who was Maurice Abramov. Uh, Maurice is uh, Belgian, and he arrived at the time I was working with the uh, suspensions of kidney tubules from the cortex, and I was doing experiments on the uh, kinetics of um, s sodium and potassium transport in the tubule preparation using radioisotopes of sodium and uh, of potassium. Um, the uh, one aspect of that was, was my first real uh, introduction to kinetics and uh, compartmental analysis was evidently required. Uh, at the time, uh, the first computers, uh, big fr mainframe computers were available and we had at NIH uh, a uh, mathematician who uh, knew how to program that for uh, kinetic analysis, Monus Berman. And so I went to Monus and uh, he set up the kinetic analysis system with the uh, computers, uh, punched the cards. You mm -hmm. probably, you, I think you're old enough to remember the punch cards in the uh, mainframe computers and uh, solved our uh, kinetic uh, problems. And uh, Maurice and I used the uh, suspension to uh, unravel some of the aspects that were mysterious in the kinetics and the, uh, in the tissue slice, but uh, still we weren't where we wanted to be because in the tubule suspension, the main uh, surface that's available to the fluid is on the outside of the tubule, and what we're really interested in was transepithelial transport that requires access to the lumen of the tubule and requires um, uh, perfusion uh, uh, of the uh, uh, tubules. So, so how did you figure out how to perfuse the tubule? Sounds um, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Hoffman was a big influence in that. He's shown uh, uh, here. This is, this is much later picture taken at the time of our uh, laboratory uh, reunion. Um, uh, Joe uh, was in the lab for a long time and eventually left to become a professor of physiology at Yale. Well, I first needed uh, pipettes to get into the tubule lumen. Joe had a microforge. He let me use his microforge to make perfusion pipettes. And uh, it's not easy to poke a perfusion pipette into the end of a piece of tubule that is floating around. And I tried, tried holding the tube in various ways with little uh, suction pipettes around the outside to open it, and none of that uh, worked. And I finally realized that I, I needed suction all around the tubule, which meant I needed a con concentric pipettes, the outer pipette to apply the suction, the inner pipette uh, to have the suction pull the tubule over that and to perfuse the tubule. Well, at, at that time, the uh, electrical potential in the red blood cell was not yet, uh, had not yet been measured. And uh, Joe wanted to measure that uh, along with uh, Walter Freigang, who was a uh, neurophysiologist at NIH. And so they made a, uh, a special uh, apparatus which held pipettes concentrically, in which the inner pipette was intended to hold the red blood cell, and the outer pipette was uh, intended to flow sucrose over the cell so they could use the sucrose gap method to measure mm -hmm. potential. It didn't work. Uh, and when it didn't work, uh, Joe willed that apparatus to me, uh, which was the uh, holder for uh, concentric pipettes that I first used to um, uh, perfuse tubules. Um, and uh, so using that, I successfully perfused my first proximal straight tubule from a collagenase suspension as shown next here, and the result was rather uh, dramatic. Uh, the tubule exploded. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> problem, of course, was that the uh, collagenase had removed the basement membrane, which is the main support uh, for the tubule, and uh, so uh, it could not withstand the pressure inside, and it was obviously necessary to dissect the tubules without collagenase. Uh, that turned out uh, to be not uh, 
not that difficult. Um, uh, with the um, not that difficult uh, from the rabbit uh, kidneys, uh, and uh, use rabbit kidneys for the initial perfusion studies and for a long time thereafter. In retrospect, uh, it was clear that the reason that the rabbit kidneys were so easy to perfuse was that unknown to me at the time, NIH had a very special colony of rabbits from which I was uh, getting the rabbits that I used, and that uh, colony of rabbits was pathogen-free. Uh, ordinary rabbits from a farm are not pathogen-free. They have kidney infections with uh, various parasites, and that increases the uh, fibrous content of the kidneys, and the tubules are much harder uh, to perfuse. So at, the, at this point, I uh, had a, uh, tubules that I could dissect and a way of perfusing them. And then uh, you needed to collect the fluid. How did you achieve that? Uh, there I was lucky. Uh, my second fellow was Jared Grantham, uh, who's shown here many years later. Uh, Jared is a very capable scientist and uh, investigator. He went on uh, after his fellowship with me to return to Kansas City, where he originated, uh, becoming eventually the chief of nephrology and has uh, remarkable accomplishments uh, with respect to uh, polycystic kidney disease, in which he uh, started a foundation. He has a lot of studies himself, and I think if anyone is responsible for uh, progress in that field, it's Jared. And underneath his portrait here, you can see that there is a pipette at the other end of the tubule. The perfusion pipettes are at the right-hand side showing the inner perfusion pipette and the suction pipette. And at the other end, he uh, simply had a uh, one pipette that he sucked the tubule into, had oil in the pipette, and introduced a collection pipette to collect the fluid as it accumulated. Mm -hmm. And this, this hoffman Freigang, uh concentric pipette apparatus, did you continue to use that? No. Um, that wasn't very practical. And the thing that it lacked was, although it hold pipettes concentrically, uh, uh, adjusting them one within the other was very tedious. And what was obviously needed was a micrometer arrangement so that the inner pipette could be advanced relative to the outer pipette. Uh, Gerhard Giebisch uh, knew what I was doing at that time, and uh, he recommended that I go to Johns Hopkins and uh, uh, visit uh, laboratory there, which was uh, run by Philip Davies, because Philip Davies had such an apparatus that he was using for other purposes. So uh, Maurice Abramov, Jared Grantham, and I went to Philip, visit Philip Davies, and sure enough, uh, he had an apparatus that would do exactly what we wanted. However, uh, it was a very delicate apparatus that he uh, essentially assembled each time he used it, and it didn't seem to me to be very... Uh, practical uh, for continued use in perfusing tubules. So I wanted to uh, have a, uh, a, a more practical uh, arrangement. And that, uh, in order to do that, I had a choice. I could have gone to the engineers who were at NIH and had them design it, uh, but I had no faith that the engineers would design something that was both uh, practical and durable. So I went directly to the mechanics at the uh, NIH uh, uh, shops mm -hmm. and uh, visited with uh, Ken Bolin. Now, Ken was the uh, head of the optical section, so-called, of the shop, which is where they had a few of the mechanics uh, or the machinists uh, who were most highly skilled. And uh, Ken himself was a watchmaker. So this is the sort of thing that would be very good. So we sat down with Ken and with um, one of the uh, very good machinists in his shop, uh, who was uh, uh, Jim White. And uh, they designed the apparatus uh, that you can see here, which was our first uh, practical apparatus for perfusing tubules. Jim uh, retired from the shop a while after that and devoted himself entirely to constructing perfusion apparatus mm -hmm. for uh, all of the laboratories around the world uh, in, including our, our own, that wanted to uh, uh, have uh, tubule perfusion uh, uh, studies. 
Now, uh, Jared uh, used uh, this apparatus, which you see to the right here in one of his early experiments, uh, to uh, hold the perfusion pipettes. And uh, on the other end, uh, you see the only existing picture of the original Hoffman and Freigang concentric pipette holder, which in this case, uh, uh, Jared was using simply to hold the uh, perfusion uh, pipette to uh, uh, collect the fluid. And then uh, what uh, improvements were uh, made subsequently to the apparatus? Well, once we once were able to, dis uh, to uh, dissect and perfuse kidney tubules, there were lots of studies uh, we wanted to do. Uh, one thing was uh, to measure fluid absorption. Initially, we used uh, I-131 albumin as a marker. Later, we and others used inulin, radioactive, and, and, and such things. Uh, you uh, developed, uh, I think, the best method, which is uh, to use uh, fluorescently uh, labeled uh, uh, markers uh, and, and get away from the radioactivity altogether. Uh, once we had uh, those measurements, we needed to do the mathematics to, uh, to uh, uh, calculate the fluid absorption rate. I'm not much of a mathematician, so I went to uh, our very good mathematician at NIH, who was Clifford Patlack. Uh, a visit to Patlack's office was a, an interesting experience. <laughs> uh, uh, in his office, uh, every surface was covered with piles of manuscripts and papers, no free surfaces at all. The entire office is surrounded by blackboards, and the blackboards were entirely filled with equations. You were allowed to erase just enough of the blackboard to put down your problem. <laughs> then Clifford would uh, stand up and go to the blackboard and would derive the equations that were needed for your project. You'd write them down, you'd take them back, and, uh, and uh, proceed with them. Uh, Clifford was, was very remarkable. Uh, he was a mathematician who was also a physiologist. He understood the mathematical requirements of physiologists, and you could talk to him directly since he was as interested in the physiology and the applications as in the mathematician mathematics itself, which is not true of, uh, of many mathematicians. Um, Clifford uh, went on to become a uh, professor at Stony Brook uh, in, in uh, New York. Um, we needed uh, methods to measure the uh, uh, ions, organic compounds, and others in the collected tubule fluid. There we were very fortunate to have within the Heart Institute the Laboratory of Technical Development, which was headed by Robert Bowman, a remarkable person, very colorful character. Uh, he was very creative and inventive, and um, he had uh, in his uh, uh, laboratory Jerry Vurek, who was the principal person uh, who helped us. Uh, and uh, together, uh, they developed the radio frequency photometer that, was, that we used for measuring uh, sodium and potassium. Um, Vurek uh, developed the uh, method for measuring total CO2 by calorimetry. Uh, he developed uh, very micro uh, uh, fluorimeters and colorimeters, and you became the guru of the microfluorimeter and the micro uh, colorimeter, uh, uh, adapting them to all sorts of uh, ass assays, which you eventually used. Um, also, uh, being able to uh, take the kidney apart and dissect the different uh, tubule segments opened up all of the tubule segments to study. Micropuncture was marvelous for studying the tubules on the surface of the kidney, but there are very important things happening in tubules within the kidney. And so we uh, developed methods for studying all of the segments eventually uh, in the kidney. Also, um, started with rabbits, which were easy to dissect, not perhaps the uh, most practical uh, animal for studying, particularly since so much of the uh, physiology study had been done on rats pr uh, previously. And I tried uh, dissecting rats and decided it was too, too hard and gave it up. Uh, you said you wanted to dissect rats. I told you it was impossible. 
but uh, being a good, a good investigator, you didn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you uh, realized that uh, getting pathogen-free uh, ra rats would be very important, just as it was with the rabbits, and you succeeded brilliantly with that. So, so a lot of your early studies were on ion transport, which required electrical measurements. How, how did you uh, achieve those types of measurements? Well, one of the uh, uh, electrophysiologists and transport physiologists was Jack Dainty. And uh, when I presented my work at a, a meeting that he was at, uh, he criticized it. He said, you know, you can't interpret these results without knowing the electrical uh, potential. Uh, I realized at that point that that could be fairly easy to measure since I could use the perfusion pipette as a bridge into the tubule lumen. And so I did it that way. Then I ran into another problem, um, and that is uh, liquid junction potentials, which I, of course, had never heard of. But um, and another one of my presentations and meetings, uh, I ran into Jared Diamond, who was a, a brilliant uh, young uh, transport uh, physiologist. Uh, Jared, of course, is now the most famous of us all, having uh, won, recently won the Pulitzer Prize for his uh, uh, work on uh, guns, germs, and uh, steel. And uh, while he was a very good uh, physiologist, he was also even a better uh, ornithologist and uh, evolutionary biologist. And his interest was history, so he's now uh, in the uh, geography department at uh, UCLA. Anyhow, uh, Jared was a very good uh, electrophysiologist. He explained liquid junction potentials to me, and he explained how you measure them and how you adjust for them. And so uh, we made uh, uh, those uh, adjustments and uh, did our first measurements of tubule potential. Shown measurements are not shown here, but the uh, fellow is shown here. This is Leon Isaacson, who came to me uh, from uh, South Africa as one of the early fellows. This is many, many years later, after his retirement from being a professor uh, in South Africa. I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, Leon, at the time he came to be my fellow, who was already much older uh, than I was. So I was uh, uh, in instructing uh, older people. And um, uh, Leon, um, uh, used uh, the uh, electrical system to measure the, the voltage across collecting ducts, cortical collecting ducts, which we were studying then. Um, further ad advance came when Sandy Hellman arrived, and Sandy uh, was a, uh, an electrical engineer, which is really just what uh, we needed. I know you're overly fond of engineers, but this was one that uh, <laughs> pay paid off for me. When he left the uh, laboratory, uh, went on to become a professor of physiology at the uh, in uh, Indiana, and uh, uh, very good, and continued his electrophysiological studies there. His job, as my fellow, was to measure the resistance of the kidney tubules. Uh, in order to measure resistance of tubules, we use cable analysis, of which I was totally ignorant. But Sandy, being an electrical engineer, was very familiar with it. Uh, the original concept having come, I think, from Lord Kelvin with relation to laying the uh, Atlantic uh, the telephone cables and uh, applied extensively in neurophysiological research with the uh, squid giant exons uh, and such. Well, anyhow, Sandy knew the cable equations, he knew how to do the measurements, and so he was able uh, to, to measure the uh, electrical potential uh, both in, uh, uh, mainly in the collecting duct and to look for uh, uh, changes in that. Um, the, uh, in the course of, uh, of uh, measuring uh, the uh, electrical resistance, Sandy uh, discovered that there was a big electrical leak uh, out uh, between the tubules and the uh, pipettes that were holding them. And, uh, that problem was solved by Jerry Vurek, whom I've already mentioned in uh, uh, Bob Bowman's lab, and uh, his solution is shown on the next uh, slide. Uh, the uh, solution was to use a resin, a uh, uh, viscous liquid resin called uh, Silgard. And the uh, Silgard uh, coated 
both the glass and the uh, tubule surface, uh, making an electrically uh, tight seal. And uh, eventually, uh, what had started as uh, a, a very uh, simple arrangement shown in A here for fusing the tubules uh, became more complicated with the sill guard introduced around the tubule in B. And finally, uh, w w the final arrangement is one in which rather than two pipettes concentrically, uh, there are four pipettes concentrically, an outer pipette which has the sill guard, then one to hold the tubule, uh, then one uh, to, uh, which is the perfusion pipette, and then inside of that a, 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 a pipette for changing the fluid so that you could uh, change the perfusion fluid going through the lumen in the middle of an experiment. And the uh, other end of the uh, arrangement, the collecting, also became more complicated, shown on the next slide. Again, starting with a uh, Jared's, Dime, Jared uh, Grantham simple arrangement in A, then having a sill guard uh, uh, laboriously uh, placed around the tubule, which is a little bit uh, tricky in B, and finally uh, another concentric pipette to hold the sill guard around the uh, whole thing. Um, th this was uh, a much more practical arrangement. These were more practical arrangements than they appear because you could uh, set them all up and then if you clean things out carefully, leave them set up from day to day and week to week, which made the perfusion quite practical. So there were hundreds or even thousands of papers published with this isolated perfused tubule technique that you invented. What do you uh, regard as your most uh, important uh, discoveries using the perfused tubule technique? Well, a, f a few uh, uh, come to mind. There, there were a lot, but a few uh, come to mind. One was uh, looking at the uh, part of the tubule called the proximal tubule uh, and, dis and uh, uh, discovering that the uh, transport characteristics of the, that part of the tubule differed depending on which portion of it you looked at. For example, the early portions transported glucose very well and very rapidly. The late portions transported paraminohypuric acid uh, very rapidly very e easily. From that, a, a concept arose which I never held to. That was the concept of heterogeneity, that you could have heterogeneous parts in within the same part of the tubule. And uh, that was quite striking to me once when I spoke in Japan, and there was a banner over our uh, meeting, which was mostly in Japanese that I couldn't read, but in the middle of the Japanese was the word heterogeneity. It turned out that there was no word in Japanese for heterogeneity, <laughs> since they're very homogeneous, <laughs> very homogeneous uh, people. Um, I, I, I found the term uh, objectionable, as did you, uh, because what it meant was that the, uh, uh, the refinements and transport along the tubule were simply greater than the anatomists had recognized and that uh, it, gave us, it was, gave additional control. And in fact, I think we wrote a review together in which we tried to trash heterogeneity mm -hmm. uh, as a term. I, I think we may have succeeded. I haven't heard it again uh, recently. Have, have you? Mm, no, not recently. <laughs> OK. Then um, Bruce Toon, when he came, uh, uh, started on an uh, ambitious program. Uh, Bruce, uh, after his fellowship, uh, went to uh, Stanford, where he became the uh, uh, chief of pediatric nephrology. But uh, his job was to uh, remove the tubules after they were perfused and measure the concentration of the um, uh, transported solute within the tubule cells. And he was able to discover the transport steps that way uh, through the cell for glucose, in the one case, and a paraminohypuric acid uh, in the other case. Um, and uh, that, I think, later went on. Uh, recovering the tubule became fashionable. And you had some very nice studies with Soren Nielsen, which recovered tubules, I recall. Um, then uh, in proximal tubules, the uh, reabsorption of uh, salt is, uh, turns out to be very dependent on the reabsorption of organic solutes, like the glucose and amino acids that are present. And that um, 
was uh, something uh, I found when uh, I tried to get different uh, perfusion solutions and, uh, and uh, bath solutions for proximal tubules. The problem being that uh, we knew the rate of fluid absorption in rats from the micropuncture studies of proximal tubules and was much less in our isolated tubules, um, which raised the question, maybe they're just not very healthy. I, I think there were two answers to that. One answer was that uh, rabbits don't, rabbit tubules don't absorb fluid as rapidly. Second was that in our initial perfusion solutions, we didn't have all of those nice organic solutes in the, in the lumen that are necessary to get uh, the, the maximal rate of, of uh, absorption. And it's very striking if you do the experiment, if you start perfusing the tubule with a solution that has no glucose or amino acids in the uh, perfusion solution, the tubule uh, cells are very flat. The minute you put in the glucose and the amino acids, uh, the tubule cells balloon out and become very broad because of the transport step and where they're accumulated within the cells by the transporters in the lumen. Um, another uh, uh, controversial issue which we were able to address was the uh, electrical potential difference across proximal tubules. Uh, that had been measured quite well in amphibian proximal tubules and found to be about 20 millivolts lumen negative. Uh, and the same thing was initially found in the rat proximal tubules. However, that was the wrong answer. And uh, the problem was an artifact uh, in which the pieces of tissue got stuck in the electrodes or that were used to pierce the, the uh, tubules. And of course, we didn't have that problem since we had an open cannula going into the end of the tubules. And so there's some interest in our results for that measurement. And what we found was that in the early parts of the tubule, dependent on the organic solutes, it was just a couple of millivolts negative. And the late parts of the proximal tubule it was either negative or positive, depending on the uh, uh, contents of the uh, tubule fluid. Uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, Eberhard Frumter in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt uh, did the studies correctly in the rat proximal tubule and uh, confirmed our results in the uh, isolated perfused tubule. Another uh, issue which is uh, historical only is that uh, at that time there was a fashion for measuring fluid absorption from tubules by putting oil in them by micropuncture and then splitting the oil drop with the, uh, 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 a fluid that was to be transported and seeing how fast the oil drops came back together. And from that came the concept that the rate of the uh, absorption of fluid was strictly a geometric question and that the rate was proportional to the square of the radius of the tubule. Uh, I tested that in the isolated perfused tubules, varying the tubule diameter by varying the outflow pressure from the tubule and found that there was absolutely no relation to the uh, uh, diameter of the tubule. Uh, it was quite controversial at the time, but I haven't heard what was uh, then called R squared referred to in, I think, the last 30 years. 30 years, 30 yes, years definitely. The issue was settled at that point. Uh, perhaps the most striking observation that uh, we had was experiments measuring the voltage across thick ascending limbs of Henley's loop. And uh, uh, I measured it in experiments with Nordica Green, who was my technician at the time, and I know Yuha Koko, who had been a fellow, measured it uh, in Dallas, where he was perfusing tubules. And we both had the same reaction, because uh, we had all expected that the voltage would be lumen negative in all parts of the tubule, in the parts of the kidney tubules, and we found a positive voltage. And we went through the same thing, checking the leads, checking the polarity of, of everything. And uh, finally, it turned out that that was actually the voltage and that led to the discovery of the uh, sodium uh, potassium 2 chloride transporter in the lumen of the thick ascending limb, which Nordica and I were able to uh, uh, discover uh, was uh, the uh, uh, transporter that was uh, inhibited by the di important diuretics like uh, furosemide. This is a picture of uh, Nordica.
who uh, worked with me for many years. When I first came to the laboratory, she was working with uh, Ernest Kutlov, who was studying chloride content of muscle cells. But when he left the laboratory, she became my technician. And uh, she was a marvelous person, a marvelous uh, scientist. And we accomplished uh, a great deal uh, together. It was a sad day for me when she decided to retire and I could no longer work along with her. Um, another uh, discovery was made by Dwight McKinney, who was a fellow and later went on to become uh, uh, the uh, director of, an, of a big pharmaceutical company. Uh, uh, Dwight was studying uh, uh, bicarbonate transport in uh, collecting ducts. And uh, everyone knew that bicarbonate was simply absorbed by kidney tubules. And what uh, uh, Dwight discovered was that whether it was absorbed or secreted by the collecting ducts depended on whether the rabbits from which the collecting ducts were taken were uh, given alkali solutions or acid solutions. Uh, and this is now taken for granted, and there are many studies of the particular cells which absorb and secrete uh, uh, bicarbonate. But at the time, it was quite controversial. And I remember uh, the experts in the field uh, for many years greeted our discovery with, as far as I could tell, disdain, because they felt that it simply wasn't possible that this was going on. Uh, and, and finally, um, uh, some early studies of Jared Grantham uh, having to do with the, um, uh, with the root of water absorption through collecting ducts. And he found when he applied vasopressin to the collecting ducts that the, uh, with a dilute solution in the lumen, that the tubule cells swelled up, which was uh, the indication of the location of the uh, 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 channels, which eventually turned out to be water channels in the lumen membrane that are affected by uh, the antidiuretic hormone. So there were many other things, but those are the ones that come immediately to mm -hmm. mind. So back in the uh, early 80s, uh, you decided to set aside the perfused tubule uh, technique and, and go to other things. Why did you decide to stop? Uh, there were two things. One thing was uh, that you had agreed to stay out in the laboratory at that point, and you were doing a much better job of it than I was, so I might as well <laughs> let you do it. Uh, the second was that um, Science had moved on, and uh, though I was obviously very fond of perfusing tubules, there were all sorts of new developments, and it uh, was uh, enticing to me to uh, get my feet wet, so to speak, in, in some of these new areas. So, so what areas in particular did you uh, decide well, to pursue? Well, uh, decided to study osmotic regulation, uh, uh, which eventually comes from the fact that uh, in the kidney medulla of animals, there are very high concentrations of salt and urea that may be poisonous. So the question of how do the, what harm does it do to the cells and how do they adjust to it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what prompted you to go in that direction? Uh, you ought to blame. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> As you probably recall, uh, at that time, Bob Balaban was also in the laboratory. Uh, Bob is now uh, the uh, director of intramural research at uh, the uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Uh, at that time, um, he was uh, doing, and still is doing, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry uh, uh, to uh, uh, analyze the uh, uh, intracellular uh, uh, compounds and their status, uh, particularly things like uh, ATP, um, you, ha you and he had a project together in which you decided that you would use NMR imaging uh, to uh, image urea in the kidney, and that you would do that using nitrogen, which? which nitrogen 14. Nitrogen uh, 14 uh, imaging. Uh, uh, the result was that for technical reasons, that, that didn't turn out to be possible. But while you were doing the studies, uh, you saw enormous concentrations of a nitrogenous substance other than urea in the kidney medulla. Uh, 
and Bob had been previously puzzling over enormous concentrations of phosphorus containing compound in the inner medulla. And putting that together, uh, you, you realize that the compound was glycerophosphylcholine, which is one of the principal organic osmolites in kidney medullas. Um, I think we all realized uh, a little bit later that uh, we hadn't, that you hadn't discovered that, that that had been in fact discovered by Carl Ulrich in the uh, uh, 1950s, uh, Carl being a uh, uh, really uh, talented uh, German renal physiologist, uh, marvelous person, a good friend, uh, sorry to have him retired from research at this point and no longer being able to interact with him. But uh, Carl uh, found this compound in the kidney medulla. In a second paper, he figured out what it was, and uh, he knew what it was doing there. Uh, and that was something none of us either knew to begin with or remembered. And so it was sort of a fresh discovery when you, uh, when you found it. Um, so uh, that showed that there was glycerophosphocholine in the kidney medulla. Uh, in 1982, uh, Paul Yancey and George Sumro, who are uh, marine biologists, uh, had published uh, a, a landmark review on the organic osmolites and how they're accumulated in cells in response to high salt and high urea, in, uh, in their case, uh, principally in uh, marine uh, uh, species, but they also, in the review, covered plants and it's really a, a universal response. And in, in many of those examples, there's more than one organic osmolite that's accumulated. And so I uh, decided to see what the other organic osmolites uh, might be in kidney medullas. And um, uh, for that purpose, I was lucky to have as a fellow at the time, Serena Bagnasco, uh, who had, uh, uh, was Italian, had walked into my laboratory one day and asked if she could volunteer to work in the laboratory, her husband having a different job at NIH. Uh, sure, I took her as a free volunteer, and it wasn't many months along the way till I realized that she's a superb scientist and uh, found a salary for her to stay on as a uh, postdoctoral fellow in the lab. Anyhow, it was, uh, she had done other projects, but at that point it became her project to find out what the other organic osmolites were. So she uh, harvested kidneys from uh, rabbits and uh, rats that were uh, uh, either given uh, uh, a lot of water to make them diuretic and lower the osmolality in the inner medulla or were uh, uh, deprived of water to raise the osmolality. Then came the question of how to detect the compounds. Uh, we're lucky there that uh, Bob Balaban was uh, willing to uh, give us his uh, NMR uh, spectrometry expertise using um, proton NMR, and that we had in the institute uh, uh, one of the world's leading um, analytical chemists who could uh, do the same thing by mass spectrometry. And uh, between them, able to define the other organic osmolites, which were sorbitol, uh, uh, myoinositol, and a glycine bediene. And so we uh, uh, published that uh, all together. Okay, and, and then many of your studies have uh, depended on having uh, cell culture models of, of renal cells. Uh, how did you get started with that? Well, I'm not the one that started that. Uh, the one who started that uh, was uh, Joe Handler. Uh, Joe uh, was in the laboratory uh, from, from the, almost from the beginning of the time uh, I was. Uh, and for many years, uh, he was Jack Orloff's other uh, uh, fellow and uh, collaborator who worked with him, wor worked with Jack. And Joe's uh, specialty was uh, toad bladders, in which uh, he, uh, Jack, made seminal discoveries regarding uh, the role of cyclic AMP in signaling a vasopressin. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the collecting duct and in the in the toad bladder, well, uh, after studying the toad bladder, uh, we uh, read a, a very interesting uh, paper uh, 
by an investigator named Dayton Misfeld in California. And what Dayton had done was to take an existing line of uh, uh, tissue culture line from um, uh, kidney, which was called uh, MDCK, and to put it onto a porous support and to show that there was a, an electric voltage that was generated across it, giving the possibility of uh, studying transport in uh, tissue culture. Uh, Joe uh, latched onto that technique. He trained himself in tissue culture. He had some of the early tissue culture models of transport, and he established tissue culture in our laboratory. So that uh, when I wanted to use tissue culture to study the organic osmolites, it was already there, and they had just to uh, learn uh, the technology uh, from Joe. Um, we didn't uh, have at that time uh, any cell lines which were specifically from intermedullary segments. Uh, Nordica Green uh, uh, tried very hard with me to start some cell cultures from uh, intermedullary and other parts of the, of the kidney starting with uh, single tubules and we were not successful. The reason was that uh, that was before it was realized that there are uh, certain genes which have to be expressed to immortalize cells in tissue culture, and we d simply didn't have that information. But by uh, luck and by hard work, Nordica did, had succeeded in uh, starting a culture from the cells lining the intermedulla that are exposed to the same uh, high salt and high urea, uh, and we were able to use those cells in our initial studies. So getting back then to the uh, organic osmolites, how did you use the cell cultures to uh, understand the regulation of organic osmolites? Well, we uh, looked in the cell cultures to see if they would accumulate the same organic osmolites as in the uh, kidney, and it turned out that they did. And this was marvelous for us, because that meant that although it would be very difficult to study the details of their accumulation, in vivo, in the cell culture, there was a direct route uh, uh, to, to doing it. And uh, the initial um, uh, measurements of the osmolites in the cell culture were done with Bob Balaban and his nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry. But about the same time, uh, Paul Yancey came to the laboratory for sabbatical. I mentioned Paul once already, Paul being the marine uh, biologist who was the expert in this area and who had uh, co-authored the uh, landmark review in it. Well, uh, Paul uh, worked with Bob, Bob Balaban uh, to develop a uh, HPLC method for measuring the organic osmolites. That was quite practical and became the standard after that, so we were able to use that uh, to study their uh, accumulation in the kidney cells. Um, and that's still the principal method for measuring them. And so we use those cultures to uh, uh, figure out the mechanisms by which the organic osmolites are accumulated. And uh, in those studies uh, had some more very talented uh, postdocs. Uh, two of them were uh, Japanese postdocs. By that time, uh, the Japanese scientists were coming to our laboratory to uh, learn kidney physiology. Uh, they were tech Takeshi Nakanishi and uh, uh, Toshiki uh, uh, Moriyama. And um, they uh, were able to discover the uh, increased abundance of aldose reductase that was responsible for the, um, for the uh, accumulation of, of aldose of uh, sorbitol. And uh, Serena Banyasco, I'm sorry, Serena Banyasco and Shunyu Chida uh, discovered the uh, aldose reductase, uh, Takeshi and Toshiki uh, were responsible for discovering that betaine and uh, myoinositol are accumulated in the cells by, mm -hmm. by transport and that more, there were more transporters when you raise the uh, salt concentration. Then uh, Arlene Garcia Perez came as a fellow uh, to the laboratory and uh, Arlene, um, who was originally from Puerto, from uh, uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico uh, had studied at uh, MIT and Michigan in the United States. 
and had picked up some uh, experience in molecular biology along the way. And uh, she applied that uh, in studies with the cell culture in her laboratory uh, to uh, c clone the cDNA for aldose reductase, uh, which was responsible for the uh, accumulation of sorbitol, and uh, to eventually uh, show that the, uh, that that was regulated on the basis of transcription, which turned out to be the case mm -hmm. for all of the other mm -hmm. uh, organic osmolites. Then uh, Mu Kwan came along to the laboratory. Mu was actually Joe Handler's fellow, and uh, Joe and Mu worked along with me and my fellows in uh, looking into the organic osmolites. And uh, with Mu and, uh, and Joe, we were able to use expression systems in uh, toad oocytes uh, to uh, show that, uh, to clone, I'm sorry, to clone the cDNAs for the myelinositol transporter and the BDEN uh, transporter. And Mu, uh, when he left the laboratory, went along with Joe Handler uh, to jo Johns Hopkins, where Joe had become the chief of nephrology. Um, they continued to study the organic osmolites there, and together they cloned the transcription factor that's responsible for the accumulation, which they named uh, Tony BP. Uh, Mu, uh, Joe uh, has now returned from Johns Hopkins and uh, is back in our laboratory and is very, very, very welcome uh, here. Uh, Mu uh, moved out of Johns Hopkins, is now a uh, professor at the University of Maryland, and we continue to follow each other's work uh, very closely since it's remained uh, uh, very much in parallel. Um, Since then, um, uh, we've continued to investigate the signaling pathways to Tony BP, and those studies have uh, been mostly conducted by Joan Ferraris, uh, who had been a fellow in the laboratory for many years and is permanently with us and uh, is our molecular biologist and is responsible for uncovering those signaling pathways, which I'll not describe in detail since it would require too much time at this point, but it's a it's very exciting uh, to be uh, following that through and uh, have the we have the advantage of the example in the laboratory, which is you uh, uh, studying systems biology because it turns out that that's what we're getting into now, studying the systems biology of signaling of uh, uh, of osmotic stress to the stress response proteins. So tell us a little more about the damage that urea or sodium chloride at high concentrations cause in cells. Well, clearly the, the cells in the kidneys uh, manage because they survive and they function. But uh, we wanted to look at that in cell culture and uh, we had striking results uh, uh, almost uh, immediately. Uh, the background we had for that was that Yancey, again, and Somro had uh, looked very extensively into the subject in uh, marine organisms. And uh, what they found, had found was that uh, uh, elevating the salt, which is what occurs in cells if you, uh, initially when you elevate the salt concentration outside of them, or elevating the urea, which goes into the cells immediately, uh, has a very large effects on the uh, 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 enzymatic activity of, uh, uh, of proteins and on the structure and function of uh, macromolecules, including both proteins and uh, DNA, and that the organic osmolites help to protect against uh, th uh, those effects. Uh, so we started looking at it in uh, cell culture, and the uh, uh, one who uh, uh, carried out the initial studies, which were most revealing, was Dietmar Kultz. Uh, Dietmar uh, started as a marine biologist, uh, had his uh, postdoctoral fellowship, uh, first postdoctoral fellowship with uh, George Somro in California. And when he came to our lab, he started uh, studying the um, uh, cell cultures from mammalian uh, uh, kidneys. And uh, early on, uh, he found that uh, elevating the salt concentration caused an increase uh, 
in a particular protein called GAD45, growth arrest and DNA damage inducible protein 45, which is our first indication of the sort of stress that occurs in the cells with high salt. Uh, uh, those studies were continued uh, by more very talented investigators. Louis Machea, who came as a postdoc from uh, Chile, where he's returned as a professor at the University in Santiago. Uh, Natasha Dmitrieva, who came as a postdoc from uh, Russia, from St. Petersburg, uh, very talented uh, scientist whom I'm fortunate enough has agreed to stay on in the laboratory and is uh, uh, one of my most valuable and uh, valued uh, collaborators and uh, uh, associates. And in this uh, paper, uh, in this same picture, uh, Jane Zhang, uh, uh, who is a postdoc from China. And uh, Lewis uh, uh, started studies looking at the fate of cells uh, in culture when the salt and urea are, are elevated. It was able to demonstrate apoptosis, which is cell death, a particular form, form of cell death, and was able to demonstrate uh, delay in the uh, uh, cell cycle, the rate at which the cells were growing. Um, uh, Natasha uh, and Dietmar went on <coughs> to show that uh, uh, one of the uh, DNA uh, damage uh, responses, uh, which is the uh, activation of protein called P uh, P53, which is a uh, tumor suppressor protein. Uh, and they showed that elevating the salt greatly increased the abundance and activity of that, another indication of the kind of damage that was going on. Uh, Jane, together with uh, Natasha, uh, showed that uh, the cells uh, suffered oxidative damage to their proteins when the salt or the urea concentrations were elevated. And putting that all together, Dietmar, after he left the laboratory and went to the uh, University of Florida, where he was initially. He's now at uh, University of California in um, uh, uh, Davis, where he's uh, an associate mm -hmm. professor. Uh, Dietmar was able to show directly that raising the salt concentration causes the DNA in the cells to be broken up, something which is uh, incredible. And uh, uh, even more incredibly, uh, Natasha later showed that the DNA in the cells in the kidney medulla, while the salt concentration is high, is also broken up. And uh, those discoveries are, are the basis for studies that we have going on now, uh, which are aimed at uh, knowing exactly how, why these things occur and knowing exactly how the cells are able to protect themselves uh, uh, from that. So in general, looking back, uh all of the people that you've trained, they've all done extremely well in their careers after they've left. Um, what factors do you feel have allowed you to be so successful as a mentor? You've exaggerated the case. The people who have done well were very good to begin with, and they went out and did well. I've had average fellows who've done okay, and I've had other fellows who were not terribly capable and a lot of them did not do very well. So I can only take a very minor uh, part of the credit. Um, I don't think there's any particular uh, system of mentoring which is more successful than any other. Uh, what I, I do think is important is uh, the examples that are set for the fellows by the way things are run in the laboratory. I think the fellows uh, learn by example rather than by being told specifically uh, what they should do. Um, in uh, managing the laboratory after I became laboratory chief, I wanted uh, very much to have a laboratory that was comfortable, uh, as opposed, for example, to a laboratory where things are highly competitive and highly personal. I think we, we've succeeded in having a uh, happy and comfortable laboratory where the stresses are scientific uh, rather than personal. I think it's uh, very important that the fellows uh, uh, are appreciated and get uh, credit uh, 
for all of their good and for their uh, hard work, try very hard to do that. I think they have to be exposed to a laboratory atmosphere uh, with the ethics of science are very much emphasized. They have to learn by example the importance of assigning the right authorship, the importance of uh, being responsible when you review papers and uh, when you review grants. Uh, these are all things which might seem to be uh, uh, very obvious, but I, I'm not sure they're the case in all laboratories. Uh, I'm very pleased that you've chosen to continue the same way now that you're chief in the laboratory. Um, I, when I say a happy laboratory, I don't think that uh, we lack scientific criticism. I, th I think that we're very um, keen to the science and we're very self-critical and critical of other people, but the, basis, the criticism is always on the basis of the science and not on, on a personal basis of the people involved. And, fi and finally, I think by, by example, you have to uh, show them that uh, your, your standards of science are very high, that uh, you, that you uh, uh, want to um, uh, have ex experiments that are done correctly, which are done reproducibly, and uh, conclusions that, that will bear up in the present and in the future. And I hope to convey that to the fellows, and I hope that some of them have, uh, have learned it. Mm, I think they've all learned that. So uh, in, in retrospect, then, looking back at all of these 40-some uh, years in, in science, how, how do you feel about your career in science? 47 years. 47. And counting. And counting. Uh, well, uh, you and uh, many of the people I've talked to through the years have heard me gripe about working for the government and gripe about NIH. Forget that. Uh, NIH intramural program is a marvelous place to do science. And if the science is what really interests you, this is the place to be. Uh, you don't have to, you have a budget, you don't have to worry about grants, you don't have to spend all of your time doing that. You spend your time on the science. There's a certain responsibility there. The government has a big investment in you. Uh, uh, I guess the government has invested somewhere between 50 and 100 million dollars in my science in these 47 years. And um, uh, I think that our responsibility at NIH, being given this money and not being required to apply for grants, is to try to do things that are truly innovative and that might be more difficult to do elsewhere. And I think that um, the uh, tube perfusion uh, projects, I think the uh, organic osmolite projects uh, fit that uh, uh, picture uh, just as many of the things that you're doing now. And uh, so uh, what I feel is a, a gratitude to NIH and a uh, satisfaction that I've chosen to uh, uh, stay on here. Um, the science has always been very exciting to me. Uh, I like the science itself. I like the people I've been uh, 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 involved with, uh, the, uh, the many brilliant people that you interact with at meetings and uh, sci scientific organizations. Uh, it's marvelous to have enthusiastic, bright young fellows uh, to uh, have innovate in your lab and have uh, 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 be able to, to uh, interact with them uh, all of the time. And so um, my enthusiasm for the science and for NIH remains undiminished. And even though I'm well past uh, the age where I could uh, retire comfortably, I have no intention of doing it as long as my health holds up, as long as the science remains as interesting as it has been. <laughs> Well, Mo, uh, thank you very much for this um, marvelous story and, and continuing story, as you uh, point out. Uh, this is uh, extraordinarily important that we record history as it occurs, and I think that uh, it's been my great pleasure to be involved in this uh, recording uh, archival uh, history project. Thank you very much. And thank you for helping me to do it.